I'm Renee Williams. And I'm Billy Thomas. And welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. You know, Billy, we've, we've got a topic today that I'm not quite sure I like, but it de- it has a sweet name, but it definitely is not sweet. I mean, who could not like chocolate vine, right? That, doesn't that sound great? A vine with chocolate, but it's not that good. No. Now, we're glad to have you all with us today. We do have a, a, a new segment from Dr. Ellen Crocker. We're going to be looking at a new um, a new pest that's um, <laughs> poked its head up around here. So she's going to let us know what's going on with that. And we also have Laurie Thomas with the new tree of the week. So a um, big thanks to both of our presenters today. But we appreciate you all being with us today. If you have any questions, please use the chat function and you can interact with us there. And if you're on Zoom, uh, I mean, excuse me, if you're on YouTube, um, thanks for being with us. You can get us at Forest extension at uky.edu and we'll get your questions answered there but glad to have you all with us today and Renee before we get started I'd like to make one quick shout out if you don't mind Last, last night we had a program in Boyle County and um, or, excuse me, not Boyle County in Bullitt County. And it was a really a good program. And I wanted to thank all of the people that came there. And we had some viewers that were there, Renee, and they said they watched the show on a regular basis. <laughs> so I said, I will tell Renee, but I wanted to save it awesome. for the show to tell you. So big thanks to them. Um, and, and some of the nice comments we got out of there, we really appreciate that. And it made me think, please folks, share this. There's a lot of people out there that would probably appreciate the show, um, some of the content, some of our presenters and speakers, and, um, you know, encourage them to check it out as well. But we do appreciate y'all being with us today. Definitely. So you know what? Let's go ahead and get started. And we have Dr. Ellen Crocker on, and she is going to be talking about something that is not very sweet. (laughs) I know, always with the doom and gloom over here. Um, (laughs) But today I'm going to be talking about a new invasive plant that you should have on your radar because if you are out there looking for it and you see it before it spreads and becomes a problem, you will be much better off. And our pesky plant for the day, the invasive plant we're going to be talking about is chocolate vine. Um, But as Billy and Renee mentioned, don't be fooled by the sweet name. Um, It might sound good and it actually is edible. You can eat the fruits of chocolate vine, but it grows extremely fast and it can climb over plants and smother trees, shrubs, whatever else you want to be growing there. So in this edition of Pesky Plants, we'll talk a little bit about chocolate vine, uh, what it is, how to identify it, and what you can do if you see it. So Uh, What is chocolate vine? This is a plant that's native to Asia, and it goes by many different names. Uh, You might hear chocolate vine, which refers to a rich smell that its flowers give off when it's flowering, but you might also hear it commonly called five-leaf akibia or akibia quinata, its Latin name. Um, And, you know, whatever you call it, you don't want it because it will take over. It is a woody, semi-woody, ev- sem- or woody, semi-evergreen vine. And here you can see an area where it has just carpeted over everything, right? It can grow over the ground as a ground cover. It can climb into shrubs and trees. And this rapid growth, this ability to completely carpet over things is why it's a problem and why you don't want to see it. Um, Now, as I mentioned, the vine itself does produce this fruit that's edible and a curious gardener might be tempted and you might see it in a catalog or for sale somewhere and think, oh, wouldn't this be cool if I planted this in my garden as a decorative vine or a ground cover? And yeah, it does grow really well, but it grows a little too well. And so if you do plant it in your garden, what's going to happen is that it will take over and then it can move from there into natural areas. So this video is of a place that I recently visited where it was planted as an ornamental and really rapidly got out of control and spread out from there. You can see it's just growing everywhere. It can thrive in a range of different habitats. While it might prefer kind of moisture uh, part shade sites, it can be in the drier sites, in the wetter sites, in shady to full sun. So a lot of different potential places where this can grow. Um, And 
when you're thinking about how to identify chocolate vine, one thing that can be helpful is that it's got a really distinctive leaf pattern. Um, you can see these five leaflets that are connected in the center here, and uh, they have these long petioles at the base of each of these leaflets. This is actually one leaf, these five little leaflets that meet in the center. This pattern is called palmate, um, and it's kind of distinctive. We don't have as many things that have this leaf pattern, and I'll show you a few potential lookalikes that you can distinguish it with. So each leaf has an oval shape, and when they first come out, they start out this reddish purplish color, but then that will change over time to more of a light green if it's in the full sun or darker if it's not. Um, they produce these purple flowers in the spring that you know have that nice chocolatey smell, um, but they aren't terribly distinctive. They're kind of smaller. You might miss those, but those will develop over the summer and into the fall into these fruits. Um, although most reports suggest that fruit set is really low in our area, which is a good thing. Um, hopefully that will control it a little bit. Um, so the female flowers will grow into these hanging, um, almost sausage shaped pods. Um, they maybe, in my mind, look something like a cross between a snap pea and a green banana, um, and they have a seam running down one side, and they'll start out that light green color, but as they mature, they'll become lighter, kind of pink or purple color with time, and then they will split open uh, to reveal this uh, pulpy uh, fruit on the inside with seeds. And this is kind of in my mind at this stage, it looks like a fleshy hot dog type of deal or hot dog bun, <laughs> but uh, very distinctive, not something that you would miss. Um, now there are some lookalikes. There are many other invasive vines that can kind of grow in this similar form. If you think of something like Japanese honeysuckle, it uh, is uh, woody, semi evergreen as well. Now its leaves look totally different and it's going to have paired opposite leaves instead of those palmate leaves and the flowers are very different, uh, but it'll do some of the same things carpeting over areas and that's why it's a problem. Um, there are also some native vines that you want to distinguish this from. Uh, Virginia creeper, for example, has this same palmate leaf pattern where you have these five leaflets that meet in the center. Um, but it, and it's a vine that can grow in areas, but it looks different. Uh, these leaves are uh, pointed on their tips. The leaflets are serrated um, on their edges. So you might see it and uh, have an, a moment of concern, but this is a native species that's common uh, throughout our region. Um, another native species that also has those palmate leaves with five leaflets that meet in the center are our buckeyes. Uh, so there are several different buckeye species, both more shrub form, like the bottle brush buckeyes and the tree form buckeyes um, that might have a leaf that looks a little similar to the chocolate vine, but they're pointed and have more of these serrations or teeth along the edges of those leaflets. So with any invasive plant, prevention is the best management option. So don't plant chocolate vine. If you see it in your woods, get rid of it as soon as possible. If you're looking for an eye-catching vine, there are lots of great native options out there. I really recommend our native coral honeysuckle if what you're interested in is a beautiful decorative vine. Uh, most spread of the chocolate vine is going to be from the vegetative structures. As I mentioned, they don't produce fruit that frequently here. So take extra care if it's a site that's contaminated with potentially moving around roots and soil or even little pieces of it. Stem fragments can root out if they come in contact with the soil. So another way that it could be spread and accidentally uh, introduced to new sites. 
Um, now, small infestations of chocolate vine can be manually removed by either just pulling up the vines, um, mowing really regularly to contain that area, or smothering an area with mulch or a tarp. Uh, now that will kill everything else that's growing there too, and this does tend to carpet over things you want to keep. That's an extra challenge. A foliar application of a systemic herbicide can also be useful and can kill the root system of those impacted plants. Uh, glyphosate and triclopyr are commonly used, but always make sure anytime you're using an herbicide that you check the label and follow those laws and safety procedures. If the vines are large, you can cut them and directly apply that herbicide to the stem. Now they don't get huge though, so that might be a lot of small vines that you're doing that with. One challenge is that, as I mentioned, since this plant is growing over things, uh, care should be taken to minimize any potential damage to what it's growing around. You don't want to be killing the things you want to keep there as you're trying to kill the chocolate vine. Because the chocolate vine is semi-evergreen, there may be an application window in the late fall where your chocolate vine still has its leaves on, but our native species has have lost theirs that you could try to take advantage of. Um, that's a, a big benefit for some other semi-evergreen or uh, invasive species that keep their leaves later. So it's something that you could look to. So with that, thanks for joining me and learning a little bit more about chocolate vine, uh, the new invasive that you don't want to find in your woods. But if you do, I hope you can get rid of it before it becomes a problem and certainly advise that people don't plant this in their gardens. Yeah, I, that's looks like it almost looked like a kudzu picture. You know, that you had sent, you know, I, I'm from Eastern Kentucky and you see yeah. that everywhere. And I was like, oh no, that's another kudzu. <laughs> oh, the fruit, like pawpaw sort of look. I was, what well, I was thinking. Are they it that looks big? cool. I've never tried it. If you have tried it, you have to put it in the chat and let us know. Um, I'm going to try to find some and I can report back. Um, but uh, it is not worth it. Uh, just from my limited experience with it so far, um, where it's been planted, people really regret that decision. So save yourself some uh, hassle, some labor, and some uh, uh, purchasing of equipment. Don't plant it. Plant something else. Yes, Dr. Crocker, thank you so much for being vigilant and kind of keeping your eye out for this stuff. Um, I, who knows when we would have heard about it? Who who else would have planted right. it? But, you know. And if you're seeing it, make sure that you report it on iNaturalist and online so that people know where it is right now. This is an invasive species that, you know, we have a lot of bush honeysuckle. We have a lot of Japanese honeysuckle. We have a lot of calorie pear. They are all over the place. Um, but this is one that I think is really picking up and we're likely to see more of in the future. So you know we have it in Fayette County, correct? We do have it in Fayette County. Wow. Yeah, but I so can't there... speak for everywhere else. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. You all can help us. Our viewers are yeah, spread out definitely. across the state, so please, you know, let us yeah, know. Let we'll us know. It, sure. Yeah, it's awesome. tough stuff. But Thank again, you, yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. Great talking with you. Your lab. Don't be fooled by chocolate vine. I know it sounds delicious. We don't want it. I meant to ask you the the. The fruit on that, how big are those? It kind of looked like Billy said a pawpaw. Is it like that? I big? think it's about that size, like a sausage almost, you know, wow. like, oh. like it really did remind me of kind of like a hot it dog bun. Hot dog. Hot dog. Hot dog <laughs> there. Yeah, but I will say I have yet to spot those fruit here. So I'm going to keep my eyes peeled and see if I can see some growing in our area and see if the timing and the size is the same on that. Wonderful. Thank you so yes. much. Yes, you. really do appreciate it. Those you. fruit will develop over the course of the summer and then they ripen in the fall. So they won't oh. look like that. Right now, they're just going to be starting kind of those smaller green structures. And then over into the fall is when they kind of split open in that lighter color. It almost looked like they would bring the vines down. It looked like they were heavy compared to the vines. But... Well, the vines are really strong. I will yeah. say that um, it is it is an impressive uh, uh, kind of twining vine there. So just the smell of it is what the name 
mm-hmm. came from then. Okay. I mean, it did have a pretty flower. That flower was pretty and unique, but no. don't be fooled by don't that. Be people. Fooled. <laughs> don't, no. don't go there. Don't go there, people, please. Next yeah. thing you know, please. it'll you won't be able to see your house because right. it'll be covered with with you vines. Yeah. You wouldn't oh. plant kudzu in your yard. Don't plant this. Yes, thank you. Thank you. You probably saved a lot of people a lot of pain and suffering. So thank you. <laughs> I hope you so. Know, Another thing, do you know whether, are they actually selling these at like? I uh, haven't seen them for sale um, anywhere locally. And you can certainly purchase them online. Um, and they, they are interesting. So, you know, I understand that appeal. Uh, there's a lot of, there's, it's always, I love growing uh, pawpaws and other fruits in my garden. So I totally understand that, but, but pick a pawpaw instead, if that's your desire <laughs> as well. Yeah. Wonderful. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. Good deal. All right. Pretty interesting, but a little scary. Yeah. Um, Another invasive we have to deal with. Oh, goodness. Well, you know, and I think that's just a general reminder for all of us to be vigilant, right? You know, I know people are getting out in their woods more now that the weather's a little nicer. So, you know, if you spot something that you're not familiar with or you hadn't seen, snap a picture, send it to us, but be vigilant, really. If we can stop these problems before they get too big, it's a lot easier to manage for sure. That's probably something we should have talked to Dr. Crocker about is like, how would you go about getting rid of this or any invasive that you, you know, you come about? I mean, to me, from what I, you know, understand is that if you, when you first catch it, that's probably the best time. Yeah. Um, and so that you don't have like that picture mounds, <laughs> mounds of vines everywhere um, to have to deal with, which would definitely be very overwhelming for a woodland owner. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. So be vigilant. Yes. <laughs> Exactly. All right. We got a new tree of the week this week. We do. We do. Yeah. yeah. Talking to us is Lori Thomas. Thank you for joining us and, and doing another tree of the week. We always look forward to those. Great. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Um, yes, looking forward to do uh to presenting, sharing this tree with you all. I'm kind of rounding out the oaks. I'm, I think we're getting really close to d- doing most of the oaks we find in Kentucky. Now we have lots of oaks in the in the country, but we're focusing on Kentucky. And this week I did swamp white oak. And I think that rounds out, we finished up all of our white oaks. And it is one of our seven white oaks in the white oak group. It's a type of white oak that we find in Kentucky. So here is swamp white oak. Excellent. I'm Laurie Thomas with the University of Kentucky Forestry and Natural Resources Extension, and I'm here with the tree of the week, the Swamp White Oak. Swamp White Oak, Quercus bicolor, is a member of the White Oak Group. It is one of 20 plus species of oak found in Kentucky. Swamp White Oak is a medium sized tree that grows 60 to 80 feet tall and 24 to 36 inches in diameter. It is a relatively long lived species reaching 300 to 350 years of age. In forest stands, it has a straight trunk with ascending branches and a narrow crown. However, open-grown trees tend to have an irregular crown and persistent lower branches. Swamp white oak is often planted on golf courses, parks, and naturalized areas. The wood is valuable and commonly lumped in with white oak Quercus alba wood, and the acorns provide food for a variety of wildlife. Swamp White Oak's range includes North Central and Northeastern United States with scattered groups in Tennessee and North Carolina. It is scattered across Kentucky except in the eastern half of the state. It grows in lowlands along stream edges and swampy areas that receive periodic flooding. It is not found in permanently flooded soils. Swamp White Oak is classed as intermediate and shade tolerance. Swamp white oak is deciduous with alternately arranged simple leaves. The leaves are obovate in shape and 3 to 7 inches long and 2 to 4 inches wide. The leaf margins have irregular blunt teeth. The leaves are shiny dark green above and very pale below. In fall, leaf color ranges from golden to yellow to burgundy to copper. This species is monoecious, meaning a tree has both male and female flowers, as with other oaks. The male flowers are yellow-green catkins that are two to four inches long, and the female flowers are very small, usually green to red, and found in the leaf axils. They both appear with the leaves, and the flowers are wind-pollinated. The fruit is an acorn that's about one inch long and tan in color. The acorn cap covers about one-third of the acorn. They are usually born in doubles and on a two-inch long stalk. 
The acorns mature in one growing season and ripen in September to October. Acorns germinate as soon as they fall. Swamp white oak trees begin seed production around 20 years of age with optimum seed bearing age between 75 and 200 years. Trees produce good seed crops every three to five years with light seed crops during the intervening years. Gravity, rodents, and water disperse the acorns. The bark is gray and scaly. As the tree ages, the bark develops irregular fissures and ridges. A distinctive feature of swamp white oak is the peeling bark along the branches. The wood of swamp white oak is hard and strong and shares many of the same traits as white oak, Quercus alba. It has medium to large pores, it is ring porous, and with abundant tyloses in the larger pores. And tyloses are the balloon-like outgrowths of parenchyma cells in the large xylem cells, and they block water movement, which helps white oak's wood to be watertight. It has distinct growth rings, and swamp white oak is rated as having good resistance to decay. It is a commercially valuable wood and is used for cabinetry, furniture, interior trim, flooring, barrels, and veneer. Swamp white oak, like other oaks, is an important tree species for wildlife. Oaks are one of the top 10 trees for wildlife, according to the National Wildlife Federation. Squirrel, bear, and white-tailed deer eat the swamp white oak acorns. Varieties of birds also rely on the acorns, including ducks, geese, woodpeckers, wild turkey, and blue jays. And oaks support a wide variety of lepidopteran larval species, including the imperial moth, and hair streaks, and dusky wings. The national champion swamp white oak is in Sussex, New Jersey as of 2021. It is 268 inches in circumference, 105 feet tall, with a 102 foot crown spread. Kentucky currently does not have a champion swamp white oak. If you'd like to know more about champion trees, check out American Forest National Champion Trees or check out the Kentucky Division of Forestry Champion Trees. Now for a few fun facts about swamp white oak. Native Americans and pioneers used to eat the acorns both raw and cooked. They would also grind them into a powder and used it as a thickening in stews or mixed with cereals for making bread. Mulch of the dead leaves is reported to repel slugs, grubs, and various insects. The genus name Quercus is Latin for the oak trees and the specific epithet bicolor is from Latin and references the two colors of the leaf which are dark green above and pale below. I hope you get the opportunity to get out into your woodlands, a local park, or your neighborhood and enjoy the beautiful trees of Kentucky including the swamp white oak. That was very nice Lori. Thank you so much for doing that. Welcome. It's always yeah. interesting to see all the different aspects of, of trees. Right, absolutely. And swamp white oak's an interesting one. It's not one we see here in central Kentucky unless it's been planted. So to be honest, it's not one that I've seen a whole lot. And you notice we're kind of on the, the southern Kentucky's kind of on the southern edge of its range anyway. So yeah, it was kind of fun to, I mean, I know we we learned about it when I was in school, but to to kind of dig back into it. So yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I, you've reminded me of a lot of things that I've forgotten and introduced some new ones on these many trees. And I'll just remind folks, there is a huge repository you have of these videos on common trees of Kentucky. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so if you're interested, please check them out. They're, they're continuously some of our best hits on YouTube as well. So thanks, Laurie, for that. Appreciate it. You're welcome. And hey, I will mention, you know, we meant we go over some of these trees like swamp white oak, which is somewhat scattered around the state. We don't see it's not like we go out and see white oak everywhere. Um, if you want to actually go see some of these, check out like the UK Arboretum um, or Bernheim Arboretum. They'll have collections of oaks and things, and this will be one of the oaks that will be in their collection. So you can kind of see some of the trees that we've talked about that may not be common in your area or an Arboretum. I know there's one up in Boone County as well. So check out the, some of those Arboretums if you want to see some of these trees. Yeah, very cool. Awesome. Yep. Take care. As always, thank you. Look forward to a new one. All right. You know what? She talked about invasive species. <laughs> now she's going to actually talk about With ears burning, you Dr. Crocker. Things. You know, I was like, Dr. Crocker, how are we going to get rid of this stuff? <laughs> <laughs>
Well, I heard you say that and thought, that's a great question, Renee. <laughs> of course, you would come up with such a good, uh, you know, secondary question. And I thought we should definitely talk about it. Because when we're talking about these invasive species, um, I just really want to encourage folks that if they see something, you should say something. So if you're seeing some new invasive um, whether it's a plant like we talked about today, the chocolate vine, um, a, a new insect, like we're going to talk about spotted lanternfly in a few weeks, or, or just any kind of weird thing in your woods, uh, you should let someone know. Um, first off, you can figure out what it is. But second off, if it is a new invasive that we don't want, the sooner you catch it, the sooner you can get rid of it and not have to deal with it in the future. So one thing that I'd really encourage people to do is to report, report, report. So you can let your county agent know if you're seeing something new in your woods, a new plant. Um, maybe they know about it. You know, maybe it's an invasive plant that's already well established, but maybe it's something new and catching it now will prevent its spread in the future. You could report to your uh, forester that you work with, but there's lots of useful technology that can help you identify things and also report them. Uh, you can also report and see the location of different species with this technology. Things like EdMaps and iNaturalist. Uh, if you don't already have iNaturalist on your phone, you really should get it. It's a great identification tool, but did you know that it can also share information about where invasive plants are and what they're doing. Um, you know, it's really valuable in that way. So if you were to use iNaturalist, you can open up the app on your phone and kind of try to figure out what something is. Is this an invasive problem or not? Uh, in this case, I'm taking a video of winter creeper, which is an invasive problem. Um, but the really nice thing about iNaturalist is then if you click, what did I see? It can give you some ideas. And sure enough, uh, right at the top, you've got the invasive species that it is. And, you know, maybe you see something else that you don't like. In this case, this is an eastern red cedar. Um, you know, you might not like it for a bunch of reasons, but at least you can figure out, is that an invasive or is it not? And then when you upload that observation, other people in the iNaturalist community will probably comment on it and uh, let you know what they think. And if you are visiting the iNaturalist website, you can go on there and see lots of different observations all across the country for different species. Uh, so, you know, you can search, see what are people finding in your area. It's kind of fun, um, as well as a useful way to see what kind of invasives are popping up everywhere. So uh, just to kind of keep going with that theme, I'll give you an example of a different invasive plant, not what we talked about today, but a different invasive plant. Um, a couple of years ago, there was a report of a new invasive plant that has not been detected in the state before called a mile a minute weed that uh, came up on both iNaturalist as well as in a Kentucky native plant uh, social media page. And the person had found this on their property trying to figure out what it was. Um, um, you know, they'd used iNaturalist and said, huh, I think this might be this invasive plant that I don't want on my property. What do other people think? And um, due to their being really vigilant about it uh, and people hearing about it, they and a team of uh, myself, people from the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves and the Kentucky Invasive Plant Council went out to their property, found this plant and got rid of it before it could spread. Because as far as I know, it's the only patch of mile a minute weed in all of Kentucky. So we really don't want this new invasive plant uh, there. And because they were so on top of things, they could get rid of it when it was in a pretty contained area just by pulling it up bagging it uh, in garbage bags and getting rid of it. And here you can see, you know, garbage bags full of this invasive plant and their, their dogs feeling very victorious there. So, you know, just want to recognize those landowners for being so proactive about it. You know, if you see something, say something, but also let you know that if, if you're in a similar situation, it's a lot easier to do that when 
you only have a tiny little patch of it versus this is covering acres. Um, another fantastic tool that I encourage you to check out is called EdMaps. The nice thing about EdMaps is that if you go to the website, you can see these really great maps of different invasive plants. Where are they now? As well as where are they likely to spread to in the future? Um, so I encourage you to check out both EdMaps and iNaturalist to report invasive plants, but also if you're seeing something unusual or weird, um, just reach out to your county agent and let them know they can connect you to the resources uh, that you'll need. And then one other thing that I wanted to share with you is we talked about iNaturalist. And I just used iNaturalist to look up the invasive plant that we talked about today, the chocolate vine. And here you can see in Kentucky, there are 15 observations, only 15 of chocolate vine. So clearly it's a new thing. And so I mentioned that there were a few in Lexington. And if you go online, you can see what those look like. You can uh, look up photos. Uh, that someone's provided. Here are the flowers that we discussed um, and get more information on it. And you can see that others have also identified that. Um, so I just wanted to kind of share those resources with all of you and encourage you to, if you see invasive species, insects, plants, diseases, make sure you're reporting them. Thank you, Ellen. That that was great, greatly helpful, you know, because they're all they're out there and um, there's a bunch of them because otherwise you wouldn't have a segment to do if there wasn't. <laughs> so uh, unfortunately, there's a lot. <laughs> Good reminders. Yeah. Good reminders. Yeah, to definitely. Vigilant. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of times with invasive plants, at least it can feel very um, frustrating, like you'll never be able to uh, uh, tackle the problem. And, you know, many of the invasive plants, uh, if they're already out here, if they're already established, they're here to stay. They're not going anywhere. And we're just going to have to learn to live with them. Now, there's a lot we can be doing to manage them so that they don't get in the way as much. But when we're talking about these newer invasives that haven't arrived here yet, the longer we can wait, the more we can keep them out, the better. Okay. I know I have one winter creeper vine that comes up every year in my yard and I pull it and then the next year it comes up and I pull it. <laughs> it's just I don't understand why I why it does this every year, but um, I'm pulling roots, but there must be something else there. But it's it is very frustrating and I only have one. <laughs> <laughs> Well, keep at it, Renee. I like what I'm hearing. Keep up the good fight, yes. Right. So well, thank you, Dr. Cocker. We appreciate you being on and, and yeah. telling us how and to get rid of thanks for letting me pop back in here and talk a little bit more about <laughs> your, like, who who do you report this to and how does that happen? I, so, yeah. yeah. And it's if you're great. curious and want to check it out, go to iNaturalist or go to EdMaps and you can look up the maps of these different species. Where are they now and where are they likely to be in the future? Thanks. Thank you for those resources. We appreciate yeah, yeah, good tools. They'll you know, help us in this fight against these invasives. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Right, speaking of fight, you know, <laughs> you are going to help us in a lot of different things. You're going to tell us about a program that people can learn a bunch of different subjects. When yeah, I'm going to give a, a, a little quick hitter um, on our Kentucky Woodland Owner Short Course. This is a program we do annually. It has both online and field sessions. We do have limited capacity in the field session, so if this is something you're interested in, I encourage you to register right away. And I'm going to go ahead and drop um, the link in for everyone here before, so you can access that registration. Wonderful. And, yep, so there you go. So you can get to that. And I'm going to go ahead and share that screen with us as well. Um, so what I want to tell you, just a little quick preview of the Kentucky Woodland Owners Short Course. This is our website for it. Um, there's a few resources on here I wanted to point out before I get to the actual event. Um, we do have a partner section here. And in this, um, a, a couple of years ago, we did some videos with many of the partners here in Kentucky that are available to work with woodland owners um, from Fish and Wildlife.
Wildlife, to um, the Kentucky Woodland Owners Association, Natural Resource Conservation Service, um, Kentucky Division of Forestry, and many more. Um, you can check out little short videos there of these organizations, and they, they kind of go over how they serve and work with woodland owners. So that's a resource I wanted to point out to folks as well. If you don't know some of these folks um, or your local folks, please get to know them. They can be partners in conservation with you. The other thing I wanted to kind of draw your attention to is the actual registration that is now up. So once you get onto that web page, you'll see this um, registration button up there, 2023 WSC. And then we have a little link where you can register here and you get some details about that. And it's going to be starting on June 20th is the first session. And we're going to have another session on the 22nd. And then the following week, and we'll have them on the um, Tuesday and Thursday as well, the 27th and 29th. And that's in preparation for the field sessions that are going to take place on July 15th at Penny Rail State Forest in Western Kentucky and on July 29th at Elk K Farm on the Casey Boyle County line in Central Kentucky. So if you are interested in attending the field sessions, I encourage you to register as soon as possible. There's a good chance those will fill up and um, we only have limited space at both of those places. And we ran into that um, last year at one of our field sites. So again, I'm just trying to give everybody a heads up. If you know of anybody that is interested in going to the Woodland Owner Short Course or could benefit from that program, please tell them to register early as they can so that they can ensure they've got a spot saved. You're going to see the likes of um, Dr. Um, Ellen Crocker. She's going to be doing a webinar with us um, as part of the series, but she's also going to be out in the field with us. Um, we'll have Dr. Jacob Muller, Dr. Matt Springer. We'll have our KDF partners, our Fish and Wildlife partners, our NRCS partners, um, our Consulting Forester partners, our Woodland Owner Association partners. So a lot of these folks are going to be at these programs in person. So if you want to get a chance to meet some of these and learn that, um, how they can help you on your property, please register now for the Woodland Owner Short Course. We also have an option where you can just do the online sessions. Maybe the dates don't work for you for the field events or just too far away or, or whatever. You can still get a good amount of content through those four online sessions. And so there is a registration required for that. But if you do register, we will get those links to you. And if you happen to miss the live events, you will be able to view the recordings for some period afterwards. So um, I'll, I'll go into a little bit more depth on this in the coming weeks, but we did want to give a little early notification to folks that the registration is up and running on the 2023 Woodland Owner Short Course and encourage you to register soon. Definitely. You know, that brings like pretty much our whole team together in one spot. Um, and all our partners too, right? You know, it's a great yes. chance to meet a lot of people at these field sessions for sure. Right, definitely. And so it definitely uh, will get, it gets, come with questions. Like if you have questions about your property, you need to come with those questions because we are going to actually have people there who can talk to you about those um, and, and show you some, give you some information. I mean, it may be not be the person for your area. Um, however, they'll know who to help you, who to put you in contact with to get you uh, the best information possible. Yes. Thank you, um, Renee, as well. Yeah. All right. So, you know, that's all we have for today. But I, I think, you know, we crammed a lot of information into a short amount of time. Um, and uh, we greatly appreciate you joining us each week, because to be honest, we wouldn't do this show if it wasn't for you all. No, we want to serve you all. We want to help you be good stewards of your property. We want to connect you with all of the organizations and agencies that are available to work with you. We, you know, again, Renee, last night I was reminded there's a lot of folks out there that are just really unaware of all the help and support available to be good stewards of their property. So I will encourage each of our viewers, if you know someone who is a landowner or has an interest in woodlands and wildlife here in Kentucky, please let them know about From the Woods today. We feel like like it'll be a good benefit to them and they'll get a lot of information and they might be able to save themselves from some chocolate vine or, or who knows what else right um right. which is power and we try to give you the knowledge to be good stewards of your property with this show so again thank you all for being with us we do appreciate it 
Definitely. And, you know, again, we, we do the show for you. So if you have any ideas, you can go to fromthewoodstoday.com and you can give us those ideas. You know, we've actually ran several shows based on viewers' opinions of and things that they wanted to see. Um, so just don't just don't go, you know, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to bother them. Bother us. Yeah, you, know? you might help somebody else, right? Exactly. You know, like just like Ellen said, she they saw, she saw the chocolate vine and you know what? Now we're bringing it to you because we don't want we don't. 15 places is better than, you know, the whole state, you know, so <laughs> we greatly appreciate that. So, you know, send us anything that you, you feel is important or a topic that you would like. Um, again, you can go to fromthewoodstoday.com and you can um, submit us a survey and information and send it to us there. Um, but, you know, we appreciate you and we will see you next week at 11 o'clock. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye. From the woods today.